What was the Enlightenment? People say the Enlightenment was when people began to abandon God and turn to logic. That this led to great music, scientific discoveries, art, and freedom. But what does history say about this? Welcome back to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens, and today we're talking about the Enlightenment. First, we need to know that the Enlightenment came in three waves. The first wave was from 1685 to 1730, the second wave from 1730 to 1780, and the third wave from 1780 to 1815. If you study the Enlightenment, you're going to learn that the Enlightenment was when people began to abandon God that they turned to logic, and that this led to great music, scientific discoveries, art, and freedom. Did people abandon God and turn to logic? Well, some did. Did this lead to a time of great music, art, freedom, and scientific discoveries? Well, there's a few questions we need to ask. First, Those who say the Enlightenment was the start of great music, scientific discoveries, and freedom have to forget about all the great things that were happening before 1685. John Fortescue lived from 1394 till 1479, and he wrote the Commendation of the Laws of England. John wrote that the courts needed checks and balances brought into the court systems, and it was under John's influences that the courts began to change and that the idea of due process was formed. John also wrote about the necessity of the courts recognizing private property, and his writings inspired many more young lawyers to follow him. This was all 200 years before the Great Enlightenment. Even kings were invested in scientific discoveries long before the Enlightenment. In 1518, King Henry VIII had a scholar named Thomas Lincare, who worked with him. Thomas wanted to see medical practices in England being revamped. At this time, visiting a physician was really dangerous. The medical practitioners, well, they killed more people than they cured. Thomas and King Henry VIII established a college of physicians that would give licenses to only the qualified medical professionals. And this college of physicians had the power to punish medical professionals who were unethical or practiced malpractice. In 1523, the Parliament gave the College of Physicians power over all of England. That was in 1523, 140 years before the start of the Enlightenment. We talked about the Dutch Golden Age and the Leiden University in our episode called Adrian van der Donk. The Leiden University was a place of free thinking, and a lot of scientific discoveries. It was founded before the start of the first phase of the Enlightenment. Vanderdonk graduated from that university in 1641. That was 40 years before the start of the first phase of the Enlightenment. What about music and art and architecture? Well, the architecture from the 1500s was incredibly beautiful. In fact, it was far more beautiful than any building made today with our modern equipment. It would be impossible for a building with a brick work of a cathedral built in the 1500s to be built today. There are simply no masons left today who have the ability to do such elaborate artwork. When I was in college, I read Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. In fact, it was one of my favorite assignments in college. There's 24 stories in this collection, and many of them, we can see church officials being mocked in pieces of literature and given characteristics that made them appear to have sexual diseases. There are other writings, such as Dante's Divine Comedy. Dante's Divine Comedy was written in the 1300s, and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales was written in the 1400s. There's Giddo's famous paintings that were in the 1400s, and Leonardo da Vinci, which was in the 1500s. We could continue on and on, but I think the point is made. Art, music, literature, science, law, and freedom were already beginning long before the Enlightenment period. In fact, The art, music, and architecture from before the Enlightenment was greater than our art, music, and literature of today. So then, what was the Enlightenment period? Well, it was in 1784 that a man named Immanuel Kant wrote about the Enlightenment 
and he was the one who said the time period motto was dare to know and have the courage to use your own reason. The Enlightenment time period was a time when intellectuals wanted a reason to have superiority over the Bible. Remember the Thirty Year War from 1618 to 1648 and the English Civil War that was from 1642 to 1653. We have talked about both of these wars in many different episodes. But these two wars, the Thirty Year War and the English Civil War, were entwined with both political arguments as well as religious arguments. It was Catholics versus Protestants versus the Puritans versus the Anglicans versus the Calvinists, all fighting. Were these wars over religion? Or was religion used to convince people to fight in the wars? And were the wars actually about power and control over land? It really doesn't matter, because as far as the people living during that time period, they saw them as wars about religion. Did the Enlightenment change that? Did moving away from religion mean that there were fewer wars? Well, the French Revolution, which was caused by the Enlightenment, led to the murder of 17,000 people. But we're going to talk about the French Revolution in a later episode. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slander, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. The Enlightenment can be summed up with that, having a form of godliness but denying its power. During this time, there were people who believed in a form of holiness, a form of God, but denied God's power. During this time, the movement wanted to either change the teachings of the church or reject the teachings entirely. Some of those men denied miracles, which include Jesus' incarnation, his resurrection, and it became really popular to believe in deism or Unitarianism. What is that? Well, a deist, that's a religious belief holding that God created the universe and established rational, comprehensible, moral, and natural laws, but doesn't intervene in human affairs through miracles or supernatural revelation. A Unitarian is a person who believes that God is one being, but rejects the doctrine of the Trinity. Both of these beliefs were becoming trendy among the elites during the time period of the Enlightenment. Last week, we talked about the Wesley brothers. Their mother was one of the people who was concerned about the growing trend towards deism, and she spoke out against it often and taught her boys to reject the idea of deism. During these three phrases of the Enlightenment, there's a few people you should know about. David Hume was part of the Scottish Enlightenment movement. He wrote A Treatise of Human Nature. David Hume focused on human nature. He believed that human knowledge came from experience. He believed that people made choices based on their passion, not on human reason or logic. He taught that no miracles had ever happened, and he even doubted God's very existence. Voltaire was perhaps one of the most popular writers from this time period. He was a French writer. His writings are still influencing people today. Voltaire was a middle-class man whose father was an officer and a songwriter, but his birth is covered in mystery. Who his father really was is actually unknown. But he hated his family, and he attached himself to another man who he saw as a father figure, and that man was a free thinker. Voltaire went to a Jesuit college, and he loved literature and theater. His hatred for his father made him refuse to accept any form of religion, He moved from not believing to mocking in anyone who did believe in it. He was alive during a time period where he watched people who claimed to believe in God persecute other people who claimed to believe in God. And although he believed the world needed a radical change, he did believe that those changes could come through kings as long as those kings were enlightened and wanted progress. He was kicked out of Paris when he mocked the elite and he even ended up in prison. It was around that time he actually changed his name and became known as Voltaire. His writings were starting to become popular. He even became an official court poet. Voltaire never claimed to be an atheist, but a deist. He was eventually kicked out of France and moved to England. He learned to speak English, and he spread his views in England. 
He discovered Shakespeare theater and was shocked at how barbaric and full of energy Shakespeare's works were. Voltaire was friends, or at least acquaintances, with many historical giants like Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, and even a lot of theologians. He met with Quakers and he found them fascinating. He believed Sir Isaac Newton was the future of scientific discoveries. Voltaire was adamant that the world could progress to a world full of science and freedom, if only religion wouldn't stand in the way. Barak Spinoza was a Jewish Portuguese writer from Amsterdam. He came from a wealthy family and studied at a tourist school. He was incredibly intelligent, and he was preparing to be a rabbi. At age 17, he quit his studies to help his family's business. He did not believe that the soul was immortal, he didn't believe in the God he had been taught about, and he rejected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He taught that the Ten Commandments were not given by God, and that the Jewish people had no reason to follow them. Not surprisingly, he left Judaism behind, and he wrote a lot of books. One of his books, The Ethics, became a best-known piece of literature. He is also famous for a book on theological political treaties which was inspired by the tolerance he found in Holland. John Locke was an English philosopher who was trained to be a medical doctor. He believed that a people governed by a government they consented to would be the only way to have true liberty. This was a radical idea. He wrote that people have three natural rights, life, liberty, and private property. He also wrote about the importance of religious freedom. We've already talked about Galileo and Sir Isaac Newton. Galileo died in 1642, and Sir Isaac Newton died in 1727. We talked in our episode called Science and the Church about the brother and sister Robert and Catherine Boyle, who created the Secret Society and used their home to make amazing scientific discoveries. Robert Boyle died in 1691, just at the start of the first wave of the Enlightenment. So, art, music, literature... These were all available before the Enlightenment period. In fact, the art, music, and literature were superior to our art, music, and literature. Freedom and the ideas of self-governance were growing before the Enlightenment. In fact, they can be traced back to the Reformation. It's true that during the time of the Enlightenment, there was a movement away from the doctrines of the Church. The denial of the Trinity, the denial of miracles, or the belief that God was not involved in our everyday lives. These became trendy. It's also true that during this time period, there was a movement towards freedom and a separation of the church and the state. It's also true that life was better after this time period. But did anything else happen during this time period that may have been responsible for the shift? Yes, there was. History knows it as the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening and the Enlightenment happened at the same time. And in our next episode, we're going to talk about the Great Awakening. In the meantime, if you'd like to hear more vlogs, videos, or podcasts, check out my website, lauraleesiemens.com.